The clarinetist you've just heard is the great Ian Wheeler, and Ian has played with many notable bands, including Ken Collier, Chris Barber, Rod Mason, Mike Daniels, to name but a few, and in the past 60 years has toured the world. We spent a couple of days together on tour with the Best of British Jazz Gala in southern Germany, and I had a chance to sit with Ian and talk to him about his life story. So sit back and listen to the next hour or so while we listen to Ian and his music. So I asked Ian about how he started to play in clarinet, how he got interested in playing in jazz, and this is what he had to say. In a roundabout way, he started to play the string instruments. <laughs> oh, right, you're saying last night you played ukulele and guitar and stuff. That's right. Yeah, ukulele, of course. And, uh, Actually, I, I played a little bit of piano, of course, when I was very young. All right, about six or seven. So how did you get into clarinet from the ukulele? Well, it we went by guitar. I stopped George Formby and started <laughs> just writing. <laughs> well, I really wanted to play trombone. But at this particular time, I was, I was playing with a band, Charlie Connor. I was playing guitar. And in fact, there was a guitar and there was a, a banjo in my band, Dicky Bishop. Anyway, I was. Um, What's this around London? Or? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I've jumped down a bit. I was with a trio before that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Mike Jefferson trio, Mike Jefferson, the pianist, guy called Dave Webber in clarinet, who had been with Mike Daniel, which was. Quite popular in London at the time. So it's talking about 49 or 50, I can't remember. Oh, right. So this is before the Tranchas Revival stuff. Oh, yeah. Right. So you must have known George Webb and. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. George, uh, uh, George uh, in, the, in the late 40s, I went to, used to go down to a place called the Dutch House. Which, uh, had a jazz club there running once a week, and then there was the. Bar, red barn at Betsy and places like that. So how old were you then? You must have been just a lad, a teenager. Yeah. Mm, 18, 19. Well, I ran away to sea for a while. Mm. <laughs> All right. <laughs> what were the audiences like then? Were they younger or were they... Oh, oh yeah, they were all, they were all sort of contemporaries, really. Because they still are. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, as you came back to the clarinet, I joined... After, in, in this roundabout way, I eventually joined Charlie Connor. And I, I wanted to play trombone, uh, but I hadn't been able to afford one. And then the trumpet player offered to sell me a cheap clarinet, a high pitched instrument, uh, for 25 pub. So I took that up, so I started clarinet instead of trombone. Because it was high pitched, you had to put a bit of string down the centre. If you put the string down the centre, uh, it, it, it may have some pitch. Alright, okay. Yeah, 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 if, if you cut the string to the right length, you get it exactly a semi-tone down. Yeah, it's what they used to do in those days. Because there were a lot of cheap high pitch instruments around, you know. Anyway, that's what I did, and Charlie taught me two or three notes, and the following week, I was playing it in public. Well, I needed two or three notes, of course. Yeah. <laughs> I'd play these two or three notes and uh, back into Charlie, Charlie Solo. Mm -hmm. The only lessons I ever had, musically apart from piano when I was young, was um, I did have a series of lessons on guitar. I went to guitar lessons for a few months. And, mm -hmm. it's, um, anyway, that's how I started playing What was the first gig quite then? Well, the, the first professional gig I ever did, I got paid for, was on guitar with a dance band called Pet. On New Year's Eve, I used to be in the, the motorcycle club, I was a motorcycle club, um, and uh, the, the, this trio used to come and play at our club meetings sometimes. And I used to sit in on guitar, you know, occasions, and sitting in all the dance bands, that's fun, you know, that bit. And anyway, this particular time, they had to augment to a quartet, so they asked me, could I do the gigs? <laughs> I always remember it. Uh, so it must have been acoustic guitar, I suppose. Oh, it was acoustic, yeah. yeah. It, it, it was a, 
it was a round hole that I was at, you know. Mm -hmm. Martin Coletti, another nice guitar. Yes, sir. So I did this gig until midnight or quarter past midnight in New Year's Eve. And I, got, I think I got paid about like £2.50. <laughs> oh, so gigs for you haven't gone up that much. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so I was very proud. That was the first professional gig I ever did. Nothing to do So how did your involvement with Ken Collier start? I had a band of my own when, when I started playing clarinet. When I left Charlie Connor, I then formed a band with the River City Jazz Band which worked out of South East London, Nottingham, uh, actually South East London, El Elton, Woolwich, that's his area. Mm -hmm. uh, I, think, I think by that time, I can't remember, I think it was a club in, in Woolwich, or maybe that was a bit later. But anyway, I, I knew most of the people who had been, it was, it was quite a small scene in those days, yeah. where I actually knew everybody, except the number, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, quite a few people from up north as well used to come down occasionally. But um, I'd met uh, I actually met the Cranes at the time. Uh, that, well, it's just a fact. Again, it's all very good. Now. Yeah. But I'd met Pat, and we were talking about the Cranes at the time. And, uh, together, as we play by the time still. And uh, uh, I was with you know, Mike Daniels, I joined the Mike Daniels band after I left the little city. Mike said I wasn't very good, but I showed promise. That's how he put me on. Teddy uh, Layton had been with the band. I probably would never have got interested in jazz had I not been misused of my first choices. Careers was was just to join the Royal Air Force and be a pilot. You want to be one of the few. Uh, well, no, the few was it was a little later. Than that. A little later than that, but, yeah. but because of my health, I couldn't. So I ran away to sea, and I came came back. I said, a friend of mine had gone into forces, left his record collection with me. Oh, that was my so first introduction yeah. to jazz, really. Yeah. Uh, he left his record collection and I started listening to bits of it. Do you remember what records you listened to? Yeah, it was uh, it was HMV's uh, Sidney Bechet. Uh, that was about the first one. I think it was Texas Moaner or something was the first one. Mm -hmm. I think that was the first one that really grabbed me. Oh, right. By Sidney Bechet, Texas Moaner. Strong Moan. melodies. Beep, 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 beep. <laughs>
that was it. And uh, the, uh, yeah, I was going to perform a band with Pat. Yeah. But with Pat and I were, I was still with the drummer's band, but Pat and I were thinking of performing a band together. Pat had been playing with uh, the Chris Barber band, which became the Ken Polly around. Ken came back from New Orleans, so Pat left. Uh, we didn't want to return first, so Ken took, took over the Barber band, mm -hmm. and became the Ken Polly band. Right? Uh, that was when Pat and I were, uh, were thinking of forming the band. Ken, you know, over, over the course of that year, Ken left the, uh, and formed another band uh, with Acker and Eddie O'Donnell and Pinnacle. Mm -hmm. I think this was in that. This was anyway, and uh, that, that was the time that Pat and I were thinking, thinking of going to bed. Uh, but Ken left the, the, the Barber band, formed this new band, and Pat was asked to join. It was in the summer of 1954, I think. Pat was asked to join. We joined the Chris Barber band. By then, he decided it would be a good thing to do. He didn't want to be a chemist anymore, so, mm -hmm. so he joined. Meantime, I'd got, I'd got into, or I'd been forced into by a friend of mine, listening to a lot of things like Phil George Lewis and people like that, I think. Yeah. Which I was quite, quite impressed with, with that sort of sound. So I got into it. So I started going around sitting in with Ken. You know, I'd, I'd go to where, when he was playing locally, I'd go around yeah. there. Have a sit-in, yeah. which was which was quite nice. In fact, I must I must confess at that time I I aimed to, to, to join the first to join the Daniels band and then to join Chris. I sort of worked it. I made myself be there mm -hmm. so that <laughs> you know what I mean. It was deliberate. Yeah, yeah, I, I, mean, so I, I, I want to join that band, so yeah. I'm going to go and sit in as much as I can. Yeah. And that, that was what actually, what in fact happened. Mm -hmm.
Well, I really want to take some time. But at this particular time, I was, I was playing with a band, Charlie Connor. I was playing guitar. And in fact, there was a guitar, and there was a sort of banjo in my band. Yes. Dickie Bishop. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's in the now. Somewhere in the That's right, yeah. yeah. Somewhere in the unit somewhere. decided he was going to go back to back to um, um, Bristol, Wales, Bristol. Wales. and so Ken, Ken asked you know my strategy worked and Ken asked me to, <laughs> <laughs> asked me to join in and that was in the that was about about four or five months after Pat joined yeah because it was quite funny because Pat and I were quite friendly at that time quite close and when Pat was asked to join <laughs> That was asked to join Chris. He came over to my house and we had a long discussion with my father about whether we should do this, whether he should do this, mm -hmm. you know, this, this big leap and join professionally. <laughs> and he's or, just about to leave. So dad said, my dad said, well, you, won't, you know, you're young, it won't hurt for a couple of years maybe. <laughs> we all thought this is still with a beer. And then exactly the same thing happened in reverse a few months later when I was given the offer to join. Professional yeah. band, yeah. Yeah. brilliant. That was Martin. <laughs> so that was it. So I joined. I joined Collier. So how long were you with, were you with Collier? In and out? Or? No, 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 I was with Collier for fifty-four to sixty. All oh, right, six years. Yeah. First gig was a residency in Germany. In fact, I, I got out. Well, I got off a sick bed. <laughs> oh, I joined Collier, but but then I, I had um. I had a bout of whatever it was, bronchitis or something. And I was supposed to go to Ireland with him for the first gig, but I couldn't. Well, I was sick. And after, 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 he did that, those two jobs, came back. And then a couple of days later, we were going to Germany. So I, I was off a sick bed. And then, uh, we went to Germany by so boat and train and that. And did a residency in two months in Düsseldorf. Mm -hmm. Night club and then two months in Hamburg and the night club and then two or three weeks in Nuremberg and yeah. the night club and uh, we were the first band to go to Germany, to the German scene, oh, right. the Polio band. Mm -hmm. It was so how, the, how do the German audiences differ to the British audience? Well, well at that time the, the German audience it was a night club, they were business people, businessmen, you know, it was sort of a, mm -hmm. not exactly a German club, although it was done up like a German club. So what did Ken think of that? Oh, it was great.
All right. Not, not a great deal of travelling. They just sort of played local, local clubs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Rod came back. He, he, he left Apple and came back down. And then we formed a band together, which became the Rod Mason and Wheeler band. You know. mm -hmm. And we, we formed a band together. And that was a very successful band. It was, it was, I would say it myself, it was a very damn good band as well. So who was in it at that time? Jimmy Garfield? Jimmy on the drums. And Chris Askins on bass. Jimmy. Um, it looks like we had various bands left there. Dickie was on it. Dickie Bishop was for mm -hmm. a while. A guy called Pete Summoner for a while. Yeah. But uh, him. And uh, then there was Bobby Fox. A great trombone player. He's placed entirely by ear, literally does, but he's got, he knows he's, everything goes in the right place. <laughs> and um, Rod and myself, and that was a very successful, especially in Germany. We went we were really big in Germany, you know. we used to sing a song about how good it was to be back on the road. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and we went it at the time. Yeah. It was really good. And um, he was a big time promoter up in Hamburg. He used to put, put he put some of the still does put some big big festivals and things. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he he had uh, he, he was touring Monty and yeah and uh, uh, at the house. Because there were a lot of English bands coming over to Germany then, weren't there? Yeah, it's, it's 70, 75, 70, 74, 75, 76. I said if if I make them, if I make them my top band. We must spend a lot of time in Germany, you know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, like sort of two thirds of the time we'd have been in Germany all the time. Yeah. And uh, the other guys didn't want to know about that, so that fell apart. <laughs> <laughs> then I teamed up with Keith Smith. Mm -hmm. That's right, Rod, Rod wanted to form this band which he called the Bad Joke Band. Do you know about it? I've seen the, the record sleeve in his house. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, Rod will tell you more about that. He, 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 this is where, when it all fell apart, when he wanted to uh, stay working in and around Plymouth. But anyway, that's what he, he wanted to do. So I, I said, right, that's it, I have a you know. yeah. and, uh, and, I, and I left that, left that uh, and we uh, I bet, met, met up with Keith Smith, he, who moved down from, from Cup of Booze Band. He'd been living in Denmark, mm -hmm. in with uh, Bill. And then uh, he came down to Kermit, so we formed a band together called Happy Jazz, mm -hmm. which was from the rem remnants of one of the little bands I was running down there. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. But Happy Jazz uh, was, was only a front line. Oh, right. It was uh, uh, Bobby Fox, when we come down to the that area, and uh, Keith and myself. And we would pick up a rhythm section, or prearrange a rhythm mm -hmm. section, wherever we went. So, yeah, yeah we, we went to France, we went to Germany, you know, East Germany.
to I went to Denmark for a while in that period as well for about two or three months and lived over there. Yeah. Played with um yeah, I joined a band in uh old trumpet player led it who 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 later went when he played with Arna Blue. I think it was an enemy. Yeah. Anyway, I was with that band for a while. Yeah. And then I moved back to England. And, and uh, then shortly after that oh I took a pub then for a couple of years. A year. Yeah, I had a pub in Saltash which had a big music room. Which is where I used to give the pub in the to run. So I put various terms on there. Yeah. Yeah. So you're a promoter as well. <laughs> Well, I used to promote my own band, which put that on the line. <laughs> <laughs> and then Chris asked me to rejoin, so I rejoined. Mm -hmm. So how long did you spend with Chris? All together, mm -hmm. 25, 26 years. Good oh, Lord. It was eight years and 20, yeah, 28 years. Because I joined Chris, rejoined Chris in 79, and I left in 98.
joined Chris, we joined Chris in 79 and I left in 98 there. Plus the, so that, 19 years plus the, yeah. plus the 8 years before. 27 years. Yeah. <laughs> so you know each other quite well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. He went through phases of style things. He went through phases of doing things. I mean, I've got great respect for Chris, actually. But, um, you know, he does... He sort of went through a thing like, we you do, you do lots of curved viral numbers, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and then, then he was, like, when I left it first, when I left the first time, he was doing these things like uh, Battersea Rain Dance and things like that, you know. And uh, then, of course, then he decided he wanted to go back to the New Orleans thing, so that was when I rejoined with uh, mm-hmm. Norman Emerson on, yeah. on playing on drums and that type of thing. He wanted this sort of thing, yeah. more easy thing, and that went. And then of course, he, when I left, he went on to this big band yeah. thing that he's running to this day. You know? yeah. Yeah. But he, he, he's, he's very enthusiastic for anything he does. He really uh, believes in what he does. and. Because he's so good at doing these things, he's able to do exactly what he wants and hang the rest of you. I'm going to do this, I like doing this, so I'm going to do it. It's a nice position to be in, isn't it? Yeah, it is a nice position to be in. And he does everything very, very well, you know. Tell us about your favourite record that you've ever made. It was a duet with Ed Hall, High Society. The most annoying thing was, although it's been issued three or four times, it's never ever said who was on it. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all, it's with, with the Barber Band, but mm-hmm. it was just Ed, Ed and I started it and went through it and, and you know, it was a, it was a duet. Mm-hmm. Right until the, towards the end of the number, when when the band came in with the backing, yeah. but it it really is to me the epitome of what I love. Yeah, yeah. it works so well. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it just just works well. Yeah, I mean, there's many other numbers that I've liked over the years, but other recordings that I do like, and a lot I don't. <laughs> it's the fact that I do, but that is really. Yeah. It was during the time when Ed Hall toured with us and mid-60s or early 60s, Ed Hall and, um, you know, it's a nice tour, two or three week tour we did with him. Yeah. And we went to the recording studios and just out of the blue decided to do this, yeah. this thing, and it worked so well. It was a golden moment. So it, it. Well, it was for me, and, yeah. I mean, to be perfectly honest, sometimes you can't tell who's playing Ed or me, you know what I mean? I mean mm-hmm. It sounds terribly big, but, yeah. but it really is. 
Not meant to be big in me, it's just marvellous, it just yeah. works. <laughs> well, it's nice when it can bounce off another musician. That's it? right, yeah. It okay. dragged me right up there to be with him, you know. It was, oh. Yeah. Anyway, that's my, that's my greatest moment and my most annoying. <laughs> <laughs>
great model making again. All comes to constructing things. That's <laughs> <laughs> always been my hobby, you know, making models, of mainly, mainly model aircraft, you know, flying mm -hmm. model aircraft. Yeah. And, uh, so, it's a thing I, I, I spend a lot of time, time yeah. on you know, in, my, in my spare time. It's always interesting to see what musicians do for their hobby. Mm. I've had various other types of like photography and all that, yeah. and various things having little praises, but through it all, not the one, the main thing. Yeah. What sort of advice would you give to a younger jazz musician now coming onto the scene? <laughs> it's exactly the same as I did about 40 years ago. Don't listen to me, listen to the original. You've been listening to the Ian Wheeler story. This program was produced by Sean Moises for Trad Jazz Radio. I hope you enjoyed the program and stay tuned for more interesting programs in future. This is Trad Jazz Radio.